Let's get close but not so close for our time. You can share from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. Let's get close but not so close. And we're off for episode 42 of Quarantine. Hey, I'm Peter Hirschberg, and, and, and we're back. Uh, it is Groundhog Day, and uh, uh, the good news about uh, this pandemic is we're getting to explore an awful lot of interesting topics. And we get to explore those topics with none other than Mickey McManus, who I'm adding to the stream just now. Hey, man. Hey, Peter. Hi. Um, How are you doing? Show, I'm great. I'm really great. Um, uh, today, uh, because of various people in various places, I'm running all of the technology. So things slow down or whatever. I'm, I'm learning new tools. Uh, but today is really about some of the most advanced tools that are out there. Um, we're calling it radical simulation. And what we're really interested in is this enormous increase in compute power that is particularly showing up in the graphics rendering and simulation world. So in a way, there's a convergence. We know that Hollywood movies and Pixar for years have been able to simulate reality. You see that in the world of gaming and then in the world of, of simulation of what the world might be like, something we talk about a lot. That same raw compute power that's really driven by things like uh, GPUs and what silicon can do as those all converge, they, they let us create an amazing amount of new forms of reality. It, it really is kind of new forms of media. And as we've seen with the creation of social media recently, if you go build a new form of media and voice it on everybody, you could get it right or wrong. And so that's what we want to talk about today. And joining us, um, Mickey, is your friend Anuj, who is one of the top mm -hmm. uh, partnership people at NVIDIA. And why is NVIDIA probably the most important semiconductor company that we could have helping us unpack this? Yeah, um, you know, I'm really excited to have Anuj on. Um, and, uh, and we worked together out in the Mojave Desert. We were basically trying to build a car that could dream about growing into a better car. And we were, we were using something called Dreamcatcher, an early technology from Autodesk Research. And we needed serious um, graphic processing, basically machine learning engines to do this. And we had to capture about 4 billion data points from sensors on the car uh, during the uh, during drives and then take it back and try to pump it into this dream catcher to see if it could evolve a new car. It was sort of like dreaming at night to come up with a better chassis, to lightweight it, to make it more structural. And Anuja was one of our, our key partners on this to try to figure this out. And NVIDIA at the time was taking stuff that heretofore was, you know, when I was growing up, you know, it was like a Cray supercomputer. And suddenly you could have it sitting on your desktop in a, or in, in a workstation. Um, and he, uh, he and NVIDIA have been really coming out of left field, uh, doing things that we really weren't expecting in terms of coming from uh, the gaming and the play space and simulation space to suddenly now they're using them to help with self-driving cars and what people call digital twin. We're going to talk about that today, which I think would be nice. And um, and so I'm super excited to have him on. Do you want to bring bring on the other guests? What's your what's your plan for today, Peter? What, why don't we Why don't we just bring on and say hello to everybody, and then we'll kind of get into it. So uh, first of all, from Nvidia, Anuj. Hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks um, for having me. I mean, we're particularly hey, excited to talk to you because um, you guys hey, are, are creating the the the. Um, graphics coprocessors and the GPUs that are driving AI, that are driving video, that are driving movies. So we're excited. And from gray, area, from, 
uh, our good friend uh, 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 Barry Through and Kalani, who is helping to program the upcoming Gray Area Festival. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, Pierre. Great to be here. And Apart you know, together. We got the theme of this show from you because when you programmed the Gray Area Festival this year, you you called it Radical Simulation, uh, which what which is really inspired by kind of where we are today with these tools, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gray Area um, as a technically literate countercultural organization that's focused on um, these communities of practice that apply uh, their skills towards social and civic transformation um, has for a long while uh, been focused on this idea of world building and simulated spaces um, and has tracked that technology developing. So with, you know, tools, you know, NVIDIA clearly has been a, um, is a company that's powered a lot of the sorts of artistic explorations that our community has made over the years. Um, but we're particularly focused on how those sorts of simulated environments, um, and this is where the radical comes in because radical, you know, it's used a lot in political contexts now, but the word really means root. You know, if you go back to the etymology of it. And so it's like, what is the root, the base, the um, core truths about the sort of things and environments that we're building worlds around now? And what are the ontologies that we want to manifest in the world and help use uh, these uh, extremely powerful graphics generating tools as uh, tools for critical thinking and imagination and vision? And how can we um, inspire um, paths forward and what is, you know, as everyone knows, it's almost trite to say now, an extremely complex and um, confusing and time in which to live. That, and it's of course so much the case that, that uh, um, artists can help us think this stuff through. And the other person that we have on today is our friend Amber Case. And Amber, you, you have been working through these forms of technology for years and have been exploring different cultural applications of, 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 of AR and VR. You curate stuff up in Portland, although you're not there today. Yeah, uh, it's kind of an interesting history. Um, like when I was six, my, my dad's friend from LA came to Denver, Colorado, where we were living and gave us a bunch of floppy disks of like soft image and like Tim Sweeney's Jill of the Jungle from like epic mega games. So I didn't know what I was doing, but suddenly I was nice. building weird 3D worlds. And I remember just, I was interested in atmospherics. I would leave the computer on overnight to, to render. And then later when I got, um, you know, when I was like 12, uh, my parents took me to this like sixth grade geography thing where we got to learn Esri software. So I was learning ArcGIS, had no idea what it was was in love with the company and then later in high school did Auto, AutoCAD, Autodesk Inventor, 3DS Max, um, and then kind of got this job offer at Lockheed Martin and called my mom's friend and was like, hey, should I take this job? And she said, you should learn about uh, anthropology. Take the, the, the subject you're bad at. And I said, okay, social studies. And she said, go to a liberal arts college, study that. So I went there and then I wrote my thesis on mobile phones as they were coming, as the iPhone had come out in 2007. And then out of that made a geolocation company, which got bought by Esri. <laughs> and so then we were looking at how the simulation worked, then did a little bit at Media Lab and ended up um, getting introduced to the concept of digital twin from PTC, uh, really having it blow my mind. And then, um, and then finding finally this book um, called uh, Low Tech Rad uh, Radical Indigenism. <laughs> and then I've been trying to slot them all together. So when this came up, it's like, oh, they're, they're, it's time to talk Today's about a good show. <laughs> it's really exciting. So it's great to be here. So you just, by the way, Amber, you just dropped some things that maybe some of our audience members don't know. Esri is one of probably the biggest geospatial companies in the world. They help us map the world. Um, Soft Image was a very early and amazing tool. I remember learning it when I was a kid too. And it was like, you could do magic, but it would take like, set it to render in the terminal and come back the next day and get like a frame. And yeah. you've got one frame and if you had, you know, 30 more, yeah. you might have a you might have a, a second, you know, or something. So so it's really come a long way. Um, let's, uh, we're gonna kick everyone off and we're gonna ask Anuj um, some questions and then we're gonna, we're gonna jump back in and, and get going. Thanks everybody. 
Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Anoush, uh, um, tell me a little bit, you know, Nvidia is sort of on fire. Um, recently acquired ARM um, has, been, has been kind of just moving up. Up, up the chain and sort of helping think about how to actually how get more people to be able to do things. And certainly industrial strength. I mean, the fact that many movies and TV studios are like actually looking at having high-end simulation for things. What are you super excited about right now? Like what's, what's going on and what are you passionate about at NVIDIA? Yeah, it's great. You know, I, uh, as you know, Mickey, we got to meet each other. You mentioned the project Greencatcher. That was a phenomenal project to work on with you and, and get to explore the inner workings of your brain, which I find still um, just amazing. Uh, I was connecting with you. Um, I, I, I feel humble being in the presence of you and Peter and others like yourselves that, um, you know, thank you the way you do. In terms of NVIDIA, uh, for the, I've been there about five years. And uh, for the first four years, I got to manage Autodesk. Uh, which was just an amazing relationship because I was able to look at M&E as an industry and manufacturing and AEC, all very new to me as an individual. My background was storage and security and data That's security. For everyone's benefit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop every time we use like uh, an acronym. So M&E is media and entertainment. It's, it's Hollywood and everything like that. Autodesk has won probably 30 years worth of Oscars for special effects. Um, AEC just means architecture, engineering, construction. It's like the built world and about 80 or 90% of most of the skyscrapers and cities and bridges are made in, the, in software like Revit and it works. Um, so yeah, you are helping us figure out what happens with machine learning suddenly, what happens with yeah. crazy quality rendering so that we could build like almost virtual cars for Ford or something like that and not have to actually you know, make a car full size or look at the light in a, in, a, in, a, in a lens and actually see all the reflections and refractions from the lens so that we don't have to mold a piece of plastic to just find out, is this gonna have the right beam spread for, for a real car to be able to be safe? It was kind of yeah. crazy and amazing time. And you, you know, so what's, what's if going I might on add now? What, what do you, what? yeah. Yeah, hey, Peter. Oh, I, I, was, I was just gonna say what I find fascinating we were talking yesterday this is probably what you're leading into now is here you are um your tools and gpus as mickey points out incredibly useful in the industrial world and in fact you can simulate a terrain right you can simulate a terrain that a car drives on and use that simulated terrain as an input to a robotic vehicle so that it might learn how to drive on that terrain right so we're inventing a reality and then we're using this reality okay here's industrial and yet you're also deeply working with the motion picture industry. And when Pixar open sourced its set of software, which we're going to talk about, that now goes in hardware, which means that sitting in your hardware and available to anybody, a game designer, a motion picture person, or Mickey and I, if we want to simulate the world, we basically have Pixar style quality to represent the world or manipulate it or hook it up to a gaming engine. So we're combining kind of industrial motion picture gaming and that, that, that level of compute power is now becoming available soon to kind of all of our mobile devices. Um, we, and right at the time when we're sitting around here in COVID with these fluid interfaces between the real world and the virtual world. And to me, that's just a very powerful moment. And so I guess one of the questions I've got is, th there's a set of incredibly powerful technologies that you're bringing to hardware that you must be excited about. Give us a sense for this landscape and its implications. Yeah, I mean, just a, you threw out a bunch of things there, and they tie into a lot of what Mickey said. I mean, you know, the thing that's exciting is, uh, and, and, and I just kind of go back just a hair here, and then I'll come back to what you said, yeah. is joining NVIDIA for me was really exciting because I'd never, ever thought about visualization, AR, and VR, robotics, self-driving cars. To me, uh, being a kid growing up in California, you know, these were like, oh, my gosh, uh, this is like sci-fi movies, like The Terminator, you know, it's going to take over the world. Um, or Ready Player One. These films had a huge impact on me and being able to be in the center of that and be part of the, com the, com the company that's building the compute stack to power those experiences, whether it's in this industrialized fashion, as you mentioned, or in a game fashion, or in a movie production, or in a digital twin for a human or for a building or a robot. Uh, it's just an incredible, incredible time. So I'm hoping I answer both your and Mickey's question I'm hyper excited. This is a crazy time. And, uh, you know, with COVID, uh, as you guys said, the, the, the opportunity has multiplied in terms of um, now I'm talking to customers across oil and gas and chemical. I'm talking to customers and partners in robotics. 
I'm talking to customers and partners in healthcare about how do you replicate the digital human project and how do you how do you synthesize humans and then um, include IoT sensors for their blood. You know, Apple announced mm. a new watch with uh, with oxygen sensing. I mean, so how do you bring all these technologies together and what does that really mean? And I think that's I think um, where where Nvidia is doing is we're building the stack of technology. And what we're really excited about is um, where the partners and customers are going to take all this amazing compute power, this amazing graphics horsepower, the technologies and tools that are integrated, which we'll talk about. And what are they going to do with it? You know, what are people going to do now that they can change their mm. workflow of I don't have to go and spend, you know, something tweaking a model or, or making a, a manipulation of a model in Maya, for example, and wait and send that to an offline render engine and wait a day or two or three to see what that looks like in the final scene. I can do that in real time now with the power of the GPU and, and compute because it's available, whether on your desktop or in the cloud or in a 5G headset. And I think that's amazing. Um, so now I'm really curious about what so the world- So real quick, news. so yeah. And, and so just uh, to unpack a few things. So GPU is a graphic processing unit. A long time back when I was growing up, you know, we had CPU, central processing units. But NVIDIA kind of came up basically saying, what if we did something in parallel? Like we, we made it massively parallel with a graphic processing unit so we could render to every pixel on the screen at the same time. So you'd have really high end gaming. And it turns out that a lot of the machine learning and AI people were kind of out in the wilderness. They we're basically being told every year, machine learning is gonna be here next year. But then 20 years later, we didn't have anything. And when people saw these chips for games, these, these GPUs, they suddenly were like, "What? Wait! I could do neural networks on this. I could take Jeffrey Hinton's work around around you know convolutional neural networks. I could run them on a chip." And suddenly, people started saying, "This game engine is coming from 90 degrees, and it's actually helping us do something new." So that's what a GPU is. The other thing you mentioned was a digital twin, and I think um, for for our audience members that don't know what that is, the idea is that sort of could you create a digital version of a thing, whether it's a car or a city or a person that has goals and, a, and constraints and objectives. And could you turn up the, the speed and simulate it? So like, could we simulate the next 30 years and learn about what would happen instead of doing the experiment on our own body or on the car? And this allows us to do things like what they call simulated data generation. Um, which is pretty exciting. Instead of training a robot by having it pick up a whole bunch of stuff, you build a virtual space with real physics, and then you basically tell it, go ahead and live for 10,000 years in the virtual space. You've built a whole bunch of synthetic training. And so it's sort of super exciting that you end up kind of allowing us to do this. Um, I know, Peter, at some point you have a you have a weather channel clip yeah. that I just think is fascinating. Oh, well, that's a good point. This, Let's, uh, this ability to right. kind of yeah. bring the future forward with simulation. Good. Can you guys hear me? I'm going to yes. just play this. Nick. We can okay, hear you. Good. So this is, yes, yeah. thumbs up. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Yep. So um, this first clip, um, in the various places this stuff can be used, uh, the Weather Channel figured out that if they're talking to people about hurricanes, you might want to show them how bad it's going to be with the possibility that they'll evacuate. And so they then wrote a simulation <laughs> to sit on the green screen that the narrator could use of what it would look like when storm surge comes in. And Florence they've been using this pretty regularly now. Of inundation across many locations. That certainly is enough to Yeah, and the idea was a lot of people didn't evacuate during Hurricane Katrina. They couldn't really imagine what the future would be like. And so the notion was, what if we could actually help them see the future right here, right on set? Perhaps up to this kind of actual simulation of what happens. large objects in it, like cars, for example, that can act like battering rams and enhance the damage that would otherwise be. And also, we know that can flood the lower levels of many structures. We also know that Florence is going to carry with it likely storm surge well above that. Perhaps not. Okay, so that's that's what stuff looked like on the Weather Channel. And I didn't even realize that they were... And, of course, what's interesting about this is this is gaming-style technology, but in the hands of a meteorologist putting into it the data of what just came in that day. And now he's simulating, essentially, very viscerally, what the world is going to look like in a few hours. Um uh, Anoush, we also have a video here that you sent, uh, which is you, which you call marbles. 
uh, which is, can you tell us about that simulation we're about to look at? Yeah, so um, what's incredible about marbles is typically when we think Does about things that are done. In... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, just, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, no worries. Uh, typically when we think about how content is created, content is created in this kind of linear workflow, right? You use one application, you take the data out of that and you give it to another application, you loosen bits of the stream along and people are importing, exporting all over the place and really can get a contextual idea of everything that's going on. Um, so the process for design can, quite, uh, can take quite a while. The other challenge is that, um, you know, you, being able to simulate in that environment, bring simulation into that environment in real time, um, really, we depend on a lot of these simulation tools, weeks and days to simulate. And the third challenge kind of is with graphics, um, you know, the amount of ho horsepower required to be able to, to take the light that's in the scene, right? Many lights or a couple of lights and actually um, use those lights correctly in that scene to, to visualize that scene so it's realistic. It's often baked, if that makes sense, in, 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 a, in a traditional game, video game, because the horsepower is just not available. However, with Omniverse and what we're showing here, what we've done is we've been able this virtual uh, simulated environment for this game, for this marbles experience with 100% real-time physics. So how do objects uh, uh, work within a simulated environment? Uh, a ball rolling over a piece of metal or a piece of wood with indentions in it. What would happen to that ball in real time? Um, with real-time lighting uh, from the scene. So it's all uh, real-time ray traced uh, versus being baked where, you know, you do the light calculations before you create the scene and then you mm. apply those. And so that's the really exciting thing about marbles. And this is done at night. We had another representation of marbles done at day when we did the first launch of our ray tracing hardware. This, what you see here is on the newest launch. And this was one of the very exciting things that uh, I think created so much excitement for the new hardware. And where did this come from? Is this software that originated with you or with Pixar? What's the, what's the history of this? Like who first started creating stuff like that? Yeah, so, you know, that's a great question. So Pixar, uh, you know, they make amazing films. I have twins that are 16 years old, a boy and a girl, and they've been watching every Pixar uh, movie under the sun. We've always appreciated the graduation of graphics um, that they've been employing in their films. What's interesting about Pixar and, and Mickey and, we were, and Peter, we were talking about this yesterday, is they've been simulating large worlds forever, right? They've been creating these massive worlds for movies uh, to create um, experiences for um, viewers of any age. And they have a really unique pipeline. What they've done is they've created this, this uh, open standards technology called USD, which is Universal Scene Descriptor. And what they've done is they've said, hey, take all these tools, the, the traditional tools that they use in their pipeline, either in-house build, in -house build like RenderMan or tools that they use from the outside from other third-party vendors. And they've allowed those tools to talk with one language. In this case, it's called USD, Universal Scene Descriptor. And so I envisioned that as I, uh, the way I explained to my kids is if, if we called out my family from India on a Zoom call and my friends from Japan and friends from China, and we try to have a conversation, uh, it'd be really difficult, right? Uh, we'd have to find a medium which we all understood besides movies. And um, so we use English and generally most of our family speaks English, so it works well. With USD, what USD is bringing and what Pixar has brought to the industry is a way of bringing in 3D geometry from any any different space, whether it's um, media and entertainment technology tools, it's architecture, engineering, construction tools, it's manufacturing technologies and tools, and it's unified those with one language, USD. So it's taken English as a medium, but in the yeah. computer graphics yeah. world and brought in 3D geometry from all these tools. And so that's what I think is really exciting. And you must be seeing interesting- And interesting you guys have adopted that and said, how do I build a whole pipeline with with it in the chip and also how to have physics in it so that people could simulate physics and also how, how can you use machine learning so you can have little agents you can say you know go live a life wandering around with gold in a in a city of course you see it for things like uh, lord of the rings people are having big epic battles and stuff and each one of those little virtual actors has a goal it's like trying to get somewhere it's trying to get across it's trying to kill the demons it's trying to do whatever and so you've kind of brought all that together and you've made it open to everybody and then accelerated it with the chips so that, um, you know, you could plug something from Autodesk, you could plug something from Esri, you could plug something from Unity, you could plug something from Unreal. Architects yeah. could work with engineers, with city planners, with motive, with, with games. Usually these are very different worlds and they're very different yeah. time horizons and quality levels. Um, and so, so the notion here is how do we bring them together? 
Um, there was another video clip that you had that I thought was kind of fun that just gives a sense of the kind of applying machine learning to those little agents called Mac Machinima. Uh, Peter, yeah, can we pull, pull that one up? Pretty awesome. It would make. Can we make it full screen? Maybe it's just my display. It's showing, showing up in a, a little, uh, if we can show it full screen. Okay, when we do that, we have to add your voice. No, oh, let's see. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to make it half screen. Uh, here, let's see if I can do it this way. Uh, right. Um, the issue is how to make this guy. You should go ahead and describe it. Okay, great. So what you're seeing here, um, this uh, demo we've done around Machinima, it's built on top of this platform we call Omniverse within NVIDIA. And the idea of, of uh, Machinima is to democratize this uh, age-old mindset of being able to take my favorite digital character from a game or from a show on the internet and actually create this um, digital experience where I myself can now be part of this experience and create my own digital world, right? So um, we've taken a bunch of technology from NVIDIA and we've embedded it into this platform we call Omniverse, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and we've exposed those technologies to our uh, different audiences. And we kind of break those audiences, but based on kind of what their job or what their role is in society is creators, developers, builders, architects, uh, people that are in the medical industry, et cetera, et cetera, right? Robotics uh, engineers and designers. But with Machinima, we've taken some core technologies, um, the real-time ray tracing, the real-time physics capability that we've, we've, we've provided to game vendors for many years, um, this idea of USD for the creation of the of content pipeline. And we've taken um, this idea of being able to do motion capture and we've democratized it using AI. So now you can have a cheap camera on your computer. As I'm moving my hands, I can take that capture, I can bind it to USD and send it to Omniverse. And now Omniverse can render that into a character on the screen. And so now imagine I can. And so historically, this would have been like an outfit that I had to wear with fiber optic and it would have to be in Hollywood and and or have a two and a half D cam, like a connect cam or something. So it's kind of using the power of all this. And I want to get to the to the other guests and then we're going to come back in for kind of a, a, a dinner table conversation. Um, so you mentioned Omniverse, you mentioned Machinima on top of that and this notion of having these this sort of collection of things like a physics engine and things like that. What I get excited about is this notion of it's not so much a digital twin as a digital stunt double. It's like, you know, you call in Brad Pitt, you know, so that so that um, Leonardo DiCaprio doesn't get his face hurt, you know, in, in the movie uh, for Hollywood. He's a stunt double. You know, you call him in to have him be, get beat up. And it would be really wonderful if we could think about how do you call in the stunt double for the planet instead of destroying the planet? How do you call in the stunt double for like how we want a city to be more equitable, how we want to experience things in the neighborhood or community and, and learn about it early because humans are very bad with foresight. You know, we're very bad with, um, you know, one of our other guests, Ting, Ting Jang, works at the Center for Advanced Hindsight and it's because humans are so bad from a behavioral economic standpoint of even understanding the future. Like sure. current me doesn't like future this, me. Uh, and current humans this, don't necessarily care about people in a hundred years. So it's very exciting stuff. And we, the fact that that's now going to be on a workstation and, you know, down in people's uh, living rooms potentially is a huge opportunity. L wait, last Mickey, point, Peter. This, um, uh, uh, you mentioned Jensen said something uh, about what he dreams uh, for, for everyone's uh, living room. Could you, can you just give us that quote from the founder? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So um, so our CEO, Jensen Huang, has really become part of the mainstream news lately. My daughter asked me the other day, Dad, have you met anybody famous? I said, well, I met uh, Jensen and he's world famous. And she goes, Dad, that's not famous. I'm talking about like, you know, Tom Cruise. I said, fine, you're in a different role than I am. <laughs> the, the funny thing is he made a statement and I yeah. felt like, oh, my God, uh, I was sitting with him and he mentioned a statement about, you know, this world of the holodeck where we will now transmit ourselves through this holodeck into the future, you know, a time machine, essentially. You can go back in the future or you can go forward in the future and you'll be in this holodeck where everything is so realistic. Everything is simulated to the extent where you can't tell the difference anymore of what's real and what's not. And we're getting there very quickly, right? With the, with the ability to bring all this um, compute yeah. power and, and really democratize it with things like the cloud, right? And provide that to our, our users. 
Anuj, uh, before we let you go, I'm going to bring on the yeah, folks. We'll get you back. Uh, can oh, you guys sorry. hear me okay? Am I, am I coming through? Yes. Uh, before yep. we let you go, Anuj, I want to bring in our friends from Gray Area because there's really no group in San Francisco that brings together artists that are trying new things with technology and also culturally helping us work through it than, than the group at Gray Area. And Barry, here we have uh, the team that is rapidly building the hardware that is adding those exponential zeros to the possibility frontier of this uh, radical simulation you're programming. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about Absolutely. what we're yeah, up to, so, and I'd love a news you listen in. Yeah, and so I think the thing, as I was talking about the sort of concept behind radical earlier, I think the thing for us is, you know, there's possibilities of what you can do, and then there's what you what we ought to do with it and, and exploring those, those possibilities because, um, you know, anytime you simulate something, it's going to be a, a, you know, and particularly as we get closer and closer to having those simulations aesthetically, uh, sensorially match reality, we have to be careful because anytime you simulate something, you're, it's, it's an inaccurate approximation of reality. And so you're automatically leaving some things out. Um, and so I think what we have for radical simulation is being really sure that we're bringing as many perspectives and voices into helping define what these imaginative worlds are. So we make sure that we're inclusive in the things that we're simulating, that they are most reflective of everyone and every perspective that we want them to be reflective of. And so we're happy. I, um, I'm happy to have Kalani Nicole on with us um, on board with Gray Area Festival, who I've known for years um, and has worked with simulate uh, artists and simulation through the gallery transfer that she founded, uh, but also is an accomplished uh, product designer and UX designer in her own right to help us um, design out this festival and experience uh, with these artists studying radical simulation. Um, Kalani, anything you'd like yeah. to say about that? Thanks, Barry. Uh, and so, you know, we put together this festival um, with two things in mind. Obviously, uh, as Barry set up, really an expansive view of simulation and how artists are using simulation technologies, um, but also thinking about how we can, as an arts organization, not just broadcast, but also pull people in and pull people together. And so that serendipity, you know, as a, as a gallery owner and a host, uh, that's what my work is about, bringing people together for those conversations and that exchange of ideas. So what we wanted to do was translate that serendipitous moment that happens annually within the walls of the gray area um, in San Francisco and bring that into the virtual space. So we uh, have been working on this all summer um, and bringing people together for these beta parties, they were called isolation cocktails and kind of refining this experience of, you know, how you're in a room with people and having conversations and exchanging ideas. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, really quickly share my screen and bring up the website um, so that we can talk through the program really quickly. So just give me one second here. Uh, here we go. Great. And our junior producer, Peter Hirschberg, is going to try to figure out how to bring it on the screen. So stay, bear with us all. He's learning as he goes. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Good to go. Success. Yeah. Nicely done, Peter. Cool. Um, yeah. So the Gray Area Festival, again, I came in with both a, a sort of curatorial perspective and also an experience design perspective. And what we've come up with is a really tight group of presenters who are going to be threaded into some very cohesive conversations that we can all jump into again, those lounges afterwards and discuss. So you see the whole lineup right here, actually. Um, our two keynotes uh, followed by two days of programming. Um, and on the first day of programming, um, we are focused on the idea here of, um, I'm just showing you the schedule really quickly. Uh, we have these also convenient mm -hmm. time changers, so you can figure out your time zones there. Uh, our friends in London will have a late night if they join us, but we're hoping to get an international group. Um, so the first day we have a keynote with Fox Harrell and then our exhibition opening reception. The exhibition is curated by Salome Sega, um, and it's called Bin Ends, and it includes 
things that didn't make the final cut into a selection of artwork. So it's also an exhibition about the artistic process reinserted into a simulated space. Um, on Thursday, we have Stephanie Dinkins, Morshan Alahari, and Amelia Winger Bearskin. And so this day is all about ancestral technology and uh, cultural narratives and refiguring cultural narratives. Um, and as you can see in between each day, we have a little discussion in between each session. Um, and then on Friday, we have Lawrence Leck, Fezero and Laturbo Avidan. Laturbo Avidan is an art, uh, an avatar who is an artist that I've worked with for a number of years at the gallery, uh, placed their work in collections. So it's like a virtual person sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly, okay. a virtual thing. And so this day is all about video gaming um, and thinking about, um, you know, virtual identity and how that's enacted in different spaces. And also Phase Zero has an interesting cross disciplinary role in the gaming industry. So she works at a AAA design studio also. Um, so that kind of like hybrid conversation is what we really want to facilitate. And then we close on Saturday with a keynote. Um, but again, those lounge sessions in between are really where the good stuff happens. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'll pause there and we can just continue. Well, Kalani, before you go before you go on, yeah, you know, you mentioned that on one of those days um, you were going to have some people talking about uh, sort of some of the indigenous work going on. And one of the artists um, has done something called wampum code. Can you give us a sense? Because I want to make sure that people understand this notion of of sort of really thinking about how what Barry said, in any simulation, there's like a donut hole of what you forget to put in or what you have to not put in because it's a simulation, it's not reality. And what you're trying to do is really be more inclusive about this, bring in a very, it's sort of sort of a very different approach that's really around kind of um, the pluriverse, you know, a, a different approach. So can you tell us about just one of the artists, like, like the wampum, wampum code one, just to give us a little taste of what you mean when you say that? Yeah, I would be really happy to tell you about Amelia's work. And then maybe I can also flash something from um, Morshan Alahari because I have another tab open for that prepped already. So um, oh, Amelia. Would be Winger awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amelia Winger Bearskin is um, working with uh, wampum.codes, which is both a VR and an AI piece. Um, but it's uh, pulling on the idea of wampum, which I'm educating myself still about this tradition, but when we look at ancestral technologies, uh, we see that there are such rich and interesting ways that people have been dealing with data and storytelling for generations. And those perspectives don't often make it into these kinds of technology discussions. Um, so I think the wampum codes is a really lovely illustration of that. Um, and then something that's really different, which is, um, you know, more about narrative is the Morishan Alahari laughing snake piece. And I'm just going to share my screen again, if Peter, if you're ready to, to jump in and help me do this. Perfect. Peter, um, get and ready. I'll share that for you. I'm looking for your screen. Uh, Here we go. Here it comes. Can you see that? Yeah. And so, the pitch. Um, yes. Morishan Alahari did a, a one in a very expansive series called She Who Sees the Unknown. Um, the Laughing Snake is one of those figures. And this was a commission from the Whitney Museum of American Art for their Art Port um, series. So you can actually click on this and view it live. And we're happy to share the link with your audience as well. Um, so I'm just going to give you an idea. It's a hypertext narrative. I'm going to click on enter and we'll listen to it for just a few minutes. You can kind of get a taste of the feel of this piece. Mm -hmm. She who saw all things in a broad bond earth and beyond and knew what was to be known. She who had seen what there was and had embraced the otherness. She to whom the image clung like a mirror, a display of crisis, and who dwelt together with a devised becoming. She knows and sees the unknown and lays them bare. She is the monstrous other, the dark goddess, the possessive jinn, the dividing persona. She restores myth and histories. I'm just gonna stop there. Um, so you can get a sense from that, that you know, the way that Morishin is already starting to use simulation, um, it's not really so much about recreating reality. It's putting us into this sort of dark, expansive landscape using immersive sound design and audio design and her own voice and senses of re-embodiment through that. Um, so these are, you know, pushing on expectations of just like simulating reality, thinking about different ways of seeing and different perspectives. 
Um, and so she'll be actually performing in front of her simulation from within the gray area theater in San Francisco. So we have all sorts of these layers of presentation <laughs> as well. Um, yeah. And before we jump, uh, I just wanna show y'all one more thing. It'll be super quick, if that's cool. Um, and I just wanna flash on the um, lounges that we have built. So you just get like a really quick sense of this. Um, this is not something that we've really shared publicly aside from those beta parties that I mentioned. Um, so this is kind of like the first time you're gonna mm. see it. Um, but so it, this is, uh, I just wanna say homegrown software. I'm so appreciative to work with Gray Area who really believes in um, trying to find alternatives to corporate platforms and create technology mm -hmm. experiences that are more relevant to the communities that are coming together and adding the value to them, right? Um, so we built this little festival lounge, very simple. You'll have to have a badge number to enter, but once you enter, um, you know, you just check yourself out in the camera, looks good. Um, and then once you're inside, the only feature of this software is humans. So it actually doesn't do a whole lot unless the humans are inside, but you can get a sense here. You would see people in conversations here and you're able to either start a conversation with someone, you can join a conversation. If you're a little bit of an introvert, you can kind of just listen in and they can pull you in if they decide to. You can also make private conversations for those sort of hallway conversations that we have at festivals. So it's this new sort of area that we're just you know putting together and trying to see if we can get some new gathering space online. Now, I noticed the other day, Kalani, you showed us um, a, a sort of a, a, a virtual world. It looked like an exhibition space where you'd be able to actually see some of their art and move around as kind of an avatar as well. We just saw the chat part of it, but I guess <laughs> what you've tried to do is recreate the gray area theater space that actually exists down on Mission Avenue and kind of think about how that might be a place where people, unfortunately last year, they were able to immerse themselves in it and and feel things with motion tracking and projection mapping and stuff. And of course we can't this year. So that's, I just wanna make sure that for, for those of you who've tuned in, next week is gonna be pretty exciting. Uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is your last speaker. I just actually got her book, uh, Ruha Benjamin. Um, yeah. and, and she's going to be on your last day and, um, you know, her preface is about the new Jim code and it's kind of a, an allusion to, to Jim Crow, which were the laws kind of during, uh, during an earlier part of the century that kind of, um, that actually limited expression for, for black lives. And she's now talking about how that code is being translated into social media. It's being translated into the simulations it's being translated in and oppressing people as well. And so I think this notion that one of the things you're trying to really open up and, and Barry said it sort of very early on was this notion of kind of what, what are we missing from the simulation? How do we get more voices in so that when we think yeah. about a future world, we're not, you, what, you know, we're not looking we, at just Jetsons or just, you know, the normal thing. And maybe, maybe Amber will talk a little more about this as yeah. well. And what are we ahead, embodying? I, I, and what sorts of things are we embodying hmm. in these simulations? Because the, uh, you know, the, what Ruha is saying in that book, and at the end, she she ends with a practice called rhetorical software that had a, a lot of great projects, um, some of which we've exhibited at Gray Area. But um, what ways of being and knowing and doing in the world are we encoding and embodying into our simulated spaces, both in terms of these VR sorts of things, but also simulations in terms of just our technology infrastructure and the things that we're using to structure and condition our realities um, and making sure that when we do that sort of thing, um, we're not carrying our injustices and biases along with us um, to the degree which is possible not to. I'm bringing Amber into the conversation here because Amber, this is so related to work that you've done for so many years. And, you know, uh, Silicon Valley's kind of gone through a couple of years where, you know, well, was it monocultural and, and you know, uh, just because it is kind of homogenous, right? And then we've seen this whole thing going on with social networks recently where uh, they, they, they reinforce particular cultures and put you in silos. And now we have this incredibly powerful technology and it would be very easy for this to reflect the culture of, of Silicon Valley or the culture of a particular type of entertainment gamer. And so how this reflects broader culture and forms new culture is fascinating. And I just want to kick this off. Um, I came up and visited you in Portland when you were curating a show uh, about a year ago. Can I tell people about that? 
Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. This was a show. This was a show of essentially new media and and uh, uh, immersive reality art created by trans people. And I was thinking, well, what would trans people have to say in code that's different? And the answer is, well, they look at the world entirely differently. They look at gender entirely differently. And so it was it was really fascinating, just the, the ways that people were getting at storytelling, at empathy, uh, at embodiment. Um, there was this one piece I put on. It was a VR headset. And there was a, somebody was, you know, lightly touching me with the feather. And the feather was there. So it was kind of like I was submitting to this feather thing. And so there was like a metal thing going on. There was a, an embodiment thing going on. There was a tension thing. Well, you would never see this in other. So it just it gave me a sense for the more cultures you bring into richer technology, the richer what's out there. Um, tell me about how you came to all of this and what and what you've been studying. Sure, sure. Um, well, I've I've split my persona into four distinct quadrants: the sensing, judging, thinking, feeling. As as a bit of a joke because. Um, for some crowds, I, I've had like a 10 year speaking career. For some crowds, they only want judging. They only want the case organic personality. And case organic goes on the stage and tells people what they want to hear and is kind of a visionary and speaks in declarative statements. And then you have Amber Case behind the scenes that's kind of thinking, right? This kind of thinking late at night, staying up, going on binges, discovering what didn't get out of Xerox Park, um, which is where I found the calm technology work. And then you have Clamber, which is a musician and is all about feelings and just gets overwhelmed and is very tied to embodiment and extremely tied to like land. So it's the type of person that like is constantly, you know, stepping into like North Portland and thinking about like the entire like people of color community that's been destroyed and, and, and is a very upset about buildings and is filming and archiving. And then you have Lulu, which is just like sensory like Gen Z, everything is bubbly and cute. And, you know, and what about the sensation to kind of bring that back from this two dimensional mm -hmm. interface that we've become. So through these different lenses, um, I like to, you know, sick one on and say like how many different perspectives, right? They say that um, kids that were only children, you know, like me that had an imaginary friend or a tape recorder, uh, they have this, uh, they call it a paracosmic immersion or it's an imaginary friend where you can start to have empathy for people that aren't you. And what I want to do in my anthropology research is to download the experience that everybody's going to have. Um, so I gave a speech once and one of the people in the audience was homeless and said, you know, because I don't have a phone, I can't get a Gmail account. Um, and everybody else in the audience was not, was very upset that he was speaking, <laughs> you know, he, he, he was not smelling very good at all these things. And I sat down with him and I was like, okay, tell me everything you can. How, who else is experiencing this? It's like, well, because I'm homeless, I can't make a ticket to tell Google that I need to have this alternative. Um, and I was like, here, I'll make you an account. <laughs> you know, but that's, that's, you know, so there's this issue of, I, and I grew up basically thinking and judging. And so my entire worldview was like, I thought that there was diversity because I watched Star Trek. And that is um, a scenario in which diversity is, um, well, that's how, that's, that's how you survive, you know, if, 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 if there's a, an, a neurotoxin, then data's still alive and fixes everything, you know, you've got Worf, you've got Geordi, you have, you know, you have all the different generations of it, um, and they're all kind of working alongside each other. Um, and so when I went into the, the world, and, you know, my best friend from Nigeria, you know, which she just got made fun of and tortured, I was super confused why this reality that I saw on TV didn't match that reality and how the people that, that watch mm. Star Trek, their brains got formatted differently than like the people who watched the Jetsons. And there were these assumptions from watching Minority Report that you should use your hands like this, you know, to, to look at your documents and photos. Mm. And I, I tried oblong out at MIT Media Lab, which is kind of based on that. And the issue is that you've got your hands above your heart and it's exhausting. <laughs> um, and really Google is the magic thing because you don't do anything, you just type in, it's like using a calculator. And so I started getting real interested in these interfaces that were like a light switch. You don't, you don't notice the light switch, you just tap on it. You don't have to be an electrician, a five-year-old could use it. What are these long-term tech that you're not gonna have a conference on a light switch? You know, what about like a bronze door handle that automatically 
um, sanitizes itself overnight. Um, and then, and then how do you make technologies like that? And then I started looking into the people that did it and it was like a dyslexic person or like, you know, James West, you know, um, you know, a, a person of color that worked at Bell Labs who made 97% of all microphone tech. And I started to say like, what's on the footnotes of VR and AR? And a lot of it was trans people and I was upset. And so my friend Shauna, who's a trans woman was like, hey, let's do this little art event. And I think what she did with, with my friend, um, Joni Whitworth, who's a queer poet, is they, <laughs> they have you put on this helmet. And then um, in a, one of the simulations, you see kind of a version of yourself and there's these tiny little horses that like trot across your virtual arm. But in real life, Shauna is going like this on your hand. And it's so nuanced because you can't go into a company and sell that. You can't say, you know, they're like, well, because, you know, even talking with some companies who are hiring me to try to do VR with them, they said, well, we could just do that with haptics. And I said, you don't understand. No matter what haptics does, the, the reason why all of these interfaces work well is because there's this the kind of feedback loop. There's some organic that's applied that's not perfect. And that imperfection, like when you're doing 3D animation, to have some grunge, to have some dirt, um, if you don't have that, there's, there's an issue. And then also that our ideas of the future are so, they keep repeating themselves because it's the same people that are doing the future. Whereas if you go back to Xerox Park, it's like, You've got historians, philosophers, artists who are, you know, talking about calm technology, which when I first started giving that speech, they said, wow, this is such a woman's perspective. And I said, well, it's been created by five guys who are now multimillionaires. So uh, definitely a female perspective. And then I said, by the way, you know, guess who used to wear high heels and tights and sling poetry and be really dramatic and wigs and rouge on their, it, it was guys. There was a romanticism around nature. So. This gender thing, I don't care. It's totally arbitrary. But it's funny to think that, you know, if, if it were given by somebody like John C. Lee Brown. So in a way, it was kind of a joke. You know, I would kind of um, uh, work with that. And then there's also this concept of, of cosmotechnics that every single culture has their own tactics. They have their own technology. So if you go to Japan, they have the sliding door. And then when they adopted technology, they made an automated sliding door um, that uh, if they were to apply that same thousands of years of history to their technology, they would have all of their, all their ideas like human nature harmony, human technology harmony. They would make all these smooth interfaces. So what I'm trying well, to I think, do, you know, Amber, yeah. I think one of the things I get, I get excited about by all this stuff though, is that in some sense, um, the only people that could afford to do um, really crazy things like the oblong technology you mentioned at MIT was, yeah. um, you know, MIT because they got, you know, giant donations of huge supercomputers. And the only people who could afford to do things was a Xerox Park, right? One of the biggest companies on the planet who just didn't know how to actually do very good tech transfer. And this notion that that now and 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 gray area has all these amazing classes and you know how do you use projection mapping how do you build your own thing and they're wide open like people who never have been able to touch this technology can touch it can play with it can create things and i think that's what i get excited by is that what you're able to do and what you're able to bring awareness to is that there are a lot more voices out there and 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 i think part of that is that somehow um, how do we allow more people to get control of the creator, you know, get control of the tools and yeah. play with these things rather than yeah. the sort of like, yeah, I, you know, I went <laughs> to whatever. And, and that's kind of what I get excited about maybe at the intersection of all these things is how do we, how do we give more people the ability to co-create, you know, what these realities might be, what our future mm -hmm. might be instead of this sort of single note Jetsons thing that you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, I was raised on Star Trek, too. You know, we used to always have fights over who in the family was a Star Wars versus Star Trek fan. But but um, but largely, you know, we had Uhuru and we had Geordi and we had Worf and we had Data and we had Chekhov and we had, you know, and, and it was one of those things where it was a very intentional from Broadbury and, and his wife and, and others, um, very intentional attempt at saying this is, of course, the way it would be in the inevitable future. We'd have cognitive diversity. We'd have cultural diversity. We'd. That's how we'd solve problems. 
Um, but those things don't play out. You know, we, we don't see those as the easy business model. We don't see those as the easy whatever. And so they don't necessarily always show up the way we want. So yeah. anyway, the whole the whole space here, I'm so excited everybody's on the call today, because, on, the, on the stream today, because it just feels like there's this intersection of all this yeah. stuff. Anuj Kalani or, or Barry uh, or anybody I, I want to kind of comment on what, this stuff? Where we yeah, might see, for sure. Uh, I have a question on where we might see the leading edge of all this going. You know, Mickey, you and I spent a lot of time with Dale in the maker movement, and that was about democratizing tools of production. And early on in computing, it was all about democratizing the ability to... Um, to write code and social media has given people TikTok and such the ability to do stuff, you know, create videos, short form, particular things. Um, if we were to think out a few years, Anuj, with the kind of technology that's coming, I mean, I'm imagining, you know, you clearly have Pixar level stuff that can be democratized. And presumably there'll be a set of tools that come out that can put this in the hands of any kid in school. And I'm just wondering if we might imagine, Kalani, you might have thoughts on this or anyone, um, how might how oh, does yeah. this stuff play out, or how do we play it out in a way that it is diversely used? Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, I'll give you my perspective, and others will chime in as well, I'm sure. But um, you know, what's interesting to me, I, you showed that machinima experience, right? And when I first heard about a machinima, it it, it, it kind of struck me like, why would anybody want to superimpose them into this cartoon or into a game and play this character? Um, you you mentioned Amber about this, uh, you know, being an only child and um, you know having this kind of a uh, secret friend that nobody else knew about. Um, you know, I, and, and my upbringing was really interesting. I grew up as Indian, um, I'm still Indian. I grew up uh, being Indian in the Bay Area in, in California. And um, I was born in England, but came here within six months. So I was for all practical purposes born here. And I grew up in a neighborhood where my parents, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. So we grew up in a neighborhood where um, there was a lot of gangs and all kinds of issues going on. And, and within that, I was trying to grow up Indian, which nobody knew what an Indian was, right? Uh, everyone was like, are you the Wawa Indian or the Dot Indian, right? And that's how they described the kind of Indian I was. And so trying to figure out how to assimilate inside of that reality and yet being this Indian, my, going home to my parents and trying to feed me rotis and uh, alu sag paneer and my mom wearing a Dot and it's like, oh, well, you're hmm. one of those Dot people. So am I a Dot person? Well, I think that Everyone with COVID now, what's happening, and I'm seeing this with my own kids, is they're being folded back inside of the house and they're not getting that socialization that they need, right? They're not going out and going to the park with their friends. And, and I feel like this machinima thing the, with the technology that we're trying to do is trying to really give it to the masses, right? So with machinima, the idea that my child could go and using cheap hardware on their machine, be able to now embed themselves in a virtual world where they can meet their friends and they can show up in whatever format they want and express themselves if they feel comfortable, right? Um, but in a digital world, kind of like when you drive your car, people are more comfortable, if you will, right? Because nobody has to know who you are. So you can play out who you are in that digital world and, and interact with people and uh, interact with people in, uh, in a way that makes you feel comfortable. I think that that technology will bring that ability to 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 mankind and i think it'll bring it to uh what we're doing here and the reason why i continue to one, work where I'm working. one reaction yeah one reaction to news to that is you know there's there's a fascinating um collection of um cognitive science around um what happens when you take somebody who has been turned into a sort of a placeholder you know a stereotype and you actually have a conversation with them about either uncomfortable stories or uh, real parts of their background, um, people who then go through that experience and then have them on their team have a hard time turning them back into a stereotype again because they see them as a real person. And I think mm -hmm. a part of this is like, how do we help people bring their real person, but in a way that it kind of sensitizes and, and allows that to happen. I was in a virtual Burning Man thing last night on, on Alt Space last night just to meet an old friend and he was bright orange. And he was bright orange because he just wanted to be bright orange, you know? And it was this notion of how do I both bring my authentic self but, and share some of that personal stuff, but also let me play. I am Legion. I have many personalities. You know, it was fascinating that Amber was talking about these four different um, personas, you yeah. know, that I, I just, I thought that was fascinating. Sensing, judging, feeling, and thinking, and how that allowed her to explain and explore that what Walt Whitman said, right? We are... We are infinite. We are we are legion. We are many things. We are not just one, you know, whatever Google thinks we are, or whatever Facebook thinks we are. 
Um, Amber, I think you might have a, an answer to this question as well, or, or in, insights. Yeah, there's a there's a billion things. The first one that really piqued my interest was, you you have domestic violence, and there was a domestic violence simulator. So they take these these angry people, and uh, they put them inside a simulator where like these men who have been abusive, end up being very small women, and in the simulator, the these huge men are getting in their space mm. and making them feel afraid and, and, and hurting them. And mm. the effect on them, there's a research paper that just came out on this. It was huge. It was that they said, I had no idea mm. that that's what it felt like to be in that position. That when somebody is in such yeah. an emotional state, they act out. Um, and if somebody can't give them a mirror of this is how it feels, they don't know, they just keep acting, right? If we are all a collection of habits, yeah. How do we have a perspective as a service? And I think in some respects, you know, the, the VR can provide that perspective. You can be a dragon, you can be a cat, you can feel like what it's like to be an ant. A lot of the embedded journalism that's come out through that is like, here's what it's like to be in, in a fight over food. Here's what it's like to watch somebody get beat up for being black, you know, and, and that is oftentimes a safe way for people in the upper middle class <laughs> um, to actually participate while having that space. Um, there's, there's another thing where, you know, just talking about childhood, I, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, but um, one of the biggest experiences for me at that, at that little Esri program that I, that I took when I was 12 is that there was this thing that you could put in your zip code and it would tell you your demographics. And I put in my zip code and it said, people in this demographic will make 20 to 30 K, no professionals. And then somebody else typed in their demographic and they said, these people make 120 to 200 K a year. And I said, what is going on? Like, this is my first time that I can almost fourth dimensionally see my future. And I decided what could I do to change it? And that feedback loop was very interesting because um, when I was there with Jack Dangerman, the head of Esri, um, and Will I Am, Jack Changermond was like, hey, Will I Am, show us where you grew up. And they had the data on it. And there was this little spot that wasn't like the other spot. And Will I Am said, oh, yeah, well, that's the people's house that we used to go to to do our homework. The person's house said, hey, you can come in here, but there's no blood crip war. So you come in here, you get free snacks. But if you fight, you can't come back. And the people that went to that house after school mm. got out. And the reason that I got out, because you know we were always told in school, the math teacher would be like, you're all gonna work at McDonald's anyway, there's no point. There were two things that happened. One is that Lockheed Martin said, we're gonna build a wing onto this low income school, we'll give it air conditioning. And I wanted air conditioning, so I took all the tests to get the air conditioning. It wasn't about, oh, I need to prove that I'm smart. Um, two, there was a thing called Art Street. It was an arts program by the African American uh, mayor of Denver at the time, Mayor Wellington Webb, and he made a program for at-risk youth. And so I got to be, as an at-risk youth, um, able to be in air conditioning again um, to do web design uh, during the dot-com boom. And it was these little tiny bits where somebody like me could participate in seeing that you could program oh. something that changed everything for me. And that's why in Portland, when I could find this weird space, it was working with people from, from PCC, Portland Community College, they're doing work kind of at the level of MIT Media Lab with absolutely nothing. Um, and they are, are yeah, being so that. clever. And, you know, and to just hold space for them without, like, there's no way for me to raise grant money for a space like that. It was basically go give talks to people, spend your extra cash, because if you write a grant for that, they're going to say, you know, we don't, we don't get this. This is underground. There's no shininess. But those, the non-shiny people, the people that don't make sense or like people who work in food service, that's where you're going to get the hungry people that have the most potential for growth. But they come along with scarcity issues, psychological issues, and they need therapy, they need support. You know, they, they have all these write-ups like, you should hire people of color. And it's like, yeah, but <laughs> when you hire them, it's not that you can just bring them in. Here we go. Here's five people. It's like, understand like how their perspective is there. And so that's that kind of perspective as a service. Um, so there's all these little programs that, that are possible to really bring this in. Um, it's just hard to- Perspective as a service. You said that, you said that <laughs> earlier and it was kind of yeah. like, I, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. You know, and I was thinking, oh, it's sales as a service. It's something. But I think your point is how do you help people get that different perspective in this space? 
You reminded me of uh, Raj Shetty at, at Harvard uh, has done a lot of studies that show that your zip code is far more important than your genetic code to actually define how what your health is going to be, how much you'll make, and little interventions like moving two blocks away so that you're actually in a space that has multi uh, socioeconomic strata, that you're actually mm -hmm. able to play in those things. Um, Manchester Craftsman's Guild famously has done this. Bill Strickland has had a whole generation of kids in the worst neighborhoods uh, uh, turn out to go on to four-year colleges, get amazing degrees, have art all over the world. Um, and so it's so it's a really interesting question about how do we how do we get perspective as a service to more people? Um, Barry, you looked like you were going to say something. I just want to make sure that 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 we get your voice oh, in here. Oh boy, as well. I can say all sorts of things. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, well, I think originally what it was is that you had, you know, I was going to say um, that yes, and everything we're doing at Gray Area, this idea of how to give people more agency in their world through learning through these technology and creative tools is really what we're talking about. And particularly in the times in which we're living right now, where everybody can feel so sort of paralyzed and helpless, that sense of agency, I think, is the most important thing that we can bestow or uh uh, what enable that's a bad word in um in people um and you mentioned uh, one thing i'll throw out here just at the end because you mentioned our education programs which is a core component of what we're doing you know it's public events and presentation and education and then project yeah. incubation um is that after a at the gray area festival we have a whole week of workshops that follow the festival and so that's a thing to check out and there are um some really fascinating stuff going on there. Um, but then in October, we're actually running a 12 week workshop with um, the McLuhan Institute led by Andrew McLuhan, who's Marshall's grandson. And it's a 12 week intensive immersive into the book, Understanding Media, um, which if you're a person out there that's interested in how media structures and conditions your reality and how to gain some more agency in these times, it would be a great thing to look into because it's a really going to be a really special course where Andrew is pulling, um, a bunch of unpublished footnotes and annotations and ephemera from, you know, his granddad's house. Um, and using that in the course materials to help give an expanded look at understanding media. So um, that's something that's coming up that I think is going to be really special and people should look into. And that's, you know, it, it's, as, as Mickey knows, we often bring Marshall McLuhan onto the show, first of all, because we always bring a dead person onto the show. And secondly, apply what he said so Peter's many years Dead ago, Guest Society. To help us understand. Amber, when I was, uh, when I was up at, uh, Actually, a year ago, when we were programming the last Gray Area Festival on immersive place-based media, and I became fascinated that Andy Warhol was doing immersive place-based media in the 60s. And then I spent some time talking to John Brockman, who worked with him. And then, Amber, you and I went off and had lunch with... Sheldon Renan. Yes, Sheldon, who, who wrote uh, the book on... Uh, uh, expanded cinema way back when, right? Was it uh, okay? So yeah, these these historical things are amazing. I wanted to pick up one other point. Um, you were talking earlier, Amber, about the importance of kind of the the human connection and not just the machine connection, even when simulating things. You gave the example of the touch and the horses, and I wanted to show another piece that was done uh, at Gray Area. This was uh, a couple of years ago, um, and we had a uh, we had a group called uh, Rhizomatics perform. This was a dance company that was also working with augmented reality. So she was a. Um, uh, uh, that was amazing. She, she was yeah. a dancer and a dance composer. The, the, the partner worked in, in, in augmented reality. And the idea was, how could you have people who are dancing being picked up by sensors and their partner is an avatar being synthesized in real time? And at times. Are you going to show that, Peter? Yeah, I'm setting it up for you right now. So here it is. So let's see how we can get That's rid of I all thought. of you and just show it. Let's see if we got this. Uh, Please just get rid of us. Yeah, show that. Uh, okay, let's just. By out. the way, it's just. Uh, yeah, well, no, by the way, to you, because we are attempting to uh, get rid of people so as to show this clip. Um, let's see what we do here. Now, what's, what's going on here is 
you can see the dancers, and then they're being sent, and the avatars that they're dancing with are being created in real time. And in the first part of the show, they are leaving. And the Has anyone here ever drifted in the city of Honolulu during rush hour? Get rid of this. seems to have now a get of business. Business. keeps there coming up. Yeah. Um, so that piece, just because we presented it in a gray area, it was called it's called Discrete Figures. It's a collaboration between Rhizomatics Research, uh, Eleven Play, who are both from Japan, and um, uh, artist Kyle McDonald. And it's a great example of how these simulated mm -hmm. environments uh, um, can be used to explore themes of embodiment and identity um, and the relationship between sort of the poetics of humans and dance and technology. Um, and so we were happy to have that and hope hope to do another collaboration with Rhizomatics a little later this year online, but it's not quite been worked out yet, but there's some stuff coming. Uh, Tell us again, Kalani, when the Gray Area Festival is and how people can uh, can sign up and be part of this. Uh, because th this whole show really originated out of this concept of, of radical simulation you guys are up to. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, the festival is next week. Starts on Wednesday. Our two uh, full days are Thursday and Friday. So try to make some time in your afternoon slash evening, depending on your location, to hang out in the lounge, continue the conversation. Um, and then Saturday, we close with the keynote from Ruha Benjamin and um, the theater piece, the interactive theater piece from Theo Trianfidilis called Antigon. Um, so it's coming right up. And what you want to do is just smash that attend button. It's large and large. You can't miss it. And that will take you to the page where you can choose your membership level. So we ask you, actually, we invite you in to become a member of the gray area in order to experience this festival. And we really do believe that you'll feel connected to a community after this experience. And we encourage you to continue your membership all year long. Their programs, and, their programs continue to evolve and grow. Um, so we welcome you in and hope to see you all there. Yeah. The that's awesome. I'm a happy member. I love what the gray area is doing. Anuj, what's your Sorry, sense? Peter, go. What, oh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, Anuj, give, I'd love your sense for kind of the, as you've rolled out really powerful tools, like you, we saw that Pixar stuff that's now jumping the shark from the motion picture world. Mickey described how it was being used in simulation for uh, uh automobiles and IOT. What are you seeing at the leading edge of how different groups are getting a hold of this technology? Because when we're talking about mixing forms of media, taking the DNA of these different forms of media and allowing other people to come in, and that's a lot of what Amber has been describing today. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we've got these incredibly powerful things. You're taking movie stuff and throwing it at gaming people, or you're throwing it at uh, folks that are doing business simulation. So what are you seeing at the leading edge which is the interesting side of how people are using this or perhaps what this other group of people that are working with emerging artists with the artistic community, what should we all be on the outlook for that you're seeing going on at the edge there? Yeah, I think, you know, if you take a look at the technologies that have been available, but really at the ultra high end for customers to consume, partners, artists, creators, all the different populations of folks in the, in the world today, um, many of those things have been out of reach, right? If you wanted to create a film today, um, like a Lion King and you want to do digital production and you wanted to be, um, you know, be able to set everything in a simulated environment, that would be a very expensive scenario, right? You'd probably have to go to an ILM studio or somewhere to actually be able to film something of that nature, even on a personal level. Um, I think what what's really interesting and what I think was really exciting is, uh, and I'll show you a clip here. Um, you can you can now be able to uh, bring that type of technology into your room as a high school or a college student, or you can spend a little bit more money uh, as you have money coming in through hopefully a, a really uh, good job. And you can even buy a little bit more horsepower and be able to th do things that are even more interesting. Um, I have a video here I thought I'd share with you. A couple of things I wanted to show the, the, the audience in terms of just the democratization of technology to enable creativity. Now, that's not a quote. I just kind of randomly, I think it's kind of the way to describe it. 
is how do we how do we take this all this available horsepower and tech and how do we provide it to the people who want to be able to express themselves in this new digital world and um and i think this is what what i'm really excited about kind of back to the earlier part of the discussion is being able to bring that to diverse sets of, of people another thing i'll share with you just for a moment in terms of how the tech's being used um one of the really interesting things about um that's i think going to bring the world together in a unique way and bring creators into kind of the future of where the world is headed is this intersection of um ai and um and in creation and what i mean by that is that you know the 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 simulation that we're all talking about here um in order to simulate inside of this world how can i take the learnings that are occurring in that world and how can i now take those those learnings and be able to direct them to something in the physical world and then mickey talked earlier about this idea of the digital twin so if i take a car for example uh, a car that will drive itself within a very short order of time we see tesla providing that capability today um, but really how do we teach that car to drive how do we teach it to know what a stop sign is or to to expect a car or a dog coming out of nowhere or a kid whose bike uh, ball run down the hill of his driveway or her driveway and then mm. now they're chasing after and how do i get the car to stop and how do i teach the car about all these unique things well this simulated world uh, and what's really interesting about it is now we're taking that data and we're creating more data and simulations um, with a variety of people uh, collaborating in this world to be able to, to send that to this car so that the car knows how to deal with millions of situations that it, you can't just teach it by putting it on the road, right? And I think I think that's what yeah, really what's it, what's interesting and news about how, this is that um, Toyota, the head of the head of R and D at Toyota, who used to run the DARPA Autonomous Car Challenge, um, said that Toyota puts Toyota cars, all their brands put about a trillion miles on the road today in the real world, like over the course of the life of their cars. And um, and his fear was if we didn't have some way to do synthetic data generation, we'd need a lot more years and a lot more accidents before we'd actually learn about this stuff. Anuj, why don't you pull up that, that clip that you wanted to show that actually shows kind of how a, a kid with a laptop, because these new chips are coming out to just be in people's laptops now. And, and the workstations, you show that clip and then we want to show something that Amber's, um, Amber wanted to share from Esri as well. So let's have you, Anuj, uh, can you put up your, sh uh, is it a share screen? Yeah, the computer let's see, will pull that you, up. Let's see, try it, uh, do you see it? No, share screen. I think, I think I just this is all on Peter now. Uh, okay, there we go. So uh, enlarge it here. It's in the so PowerPoint. So go ahead and go into the place so we can watch it full screen. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll let it play and then I'll explain what's going on. Hey, can we rotate the flag to get some light on it? Nice. This is one I wanted to one more and I'll explain what you just saw and this is a short one um, and these not um, you know meant to be uh, marketing things they're just more meant to show you what what the technology is enabling and how it's becoming accessible Misty to the demo. masses. Take seven. Thank you for asking. What are you here for? I'm oh, sorry, I uh, play. There's 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 
The humidity is 40% and the wind speed is 8 miles per hour. Should I bring an umbrella for tomorrow afternoon? It is not expected to rain in Santa Clara, California tomorrow afternoon. What is the hottest city in, in the world? The hottest city in the world is Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Where okay, so I'll pause there. I'll stop sharing. And I'll explain to you what just happened there in both of those scenarios. What we've done is we've taken all this amazing tech that we've built in-house for leveraging the artificial intelligence engines that we build for research. And we've integrated them back into this platform, Omniverse, which um, anybody can go in the world today and, uh, and download. We're going to publicly announce it here uh, at some point, and then we're going to put it out for beta where anybody can go and download it um, in, a, in a near time after that. What it's going to do is give you uh, folks the ability to be able to connect in and take advantage of this AI infrastructure stack and be able to take in things like raw camera feed, capture your body motion, and apply that to a digital character in this virtual space. You can then leverage technologies like what we call audio to face, which what you saw with the blue character, where the camera can, or you know, you can say something like, "Hi, my name is Anuj," and your voice gets captured and it gets connected to a digital human in that space that you just put yourself in and your mouth movement would then be applied to that character. So you're actually in that space for all practical purposes. And you'd be able to do this on a single GPU so, uh, without having to spend thousands of dollars on a multi-cloud environment. And I think that's really when we're thinking So when you say a single GPU, you're talking about like what's coming out in the, in the next uh, series of PCs or the next series of things. Exactly, um, but I want to make sure that we also have time. It's around five twenty. Oh, go ahead, Anuj. Sorry, now I'm just going to. What was your, that. your comment? The last comment was just that you can do it today with the technology that we have in the in the GPUs and the laptops today. So um, obviously, as time goes on, the GPUs become more advanced. It becomes faster and quicker and better. But you can actually do that today. And all the demos I just showed you, and there's a thousand more. They've all been done on existing technology that we have on machines today. This raises interesting access uh, questions. Okay. Because on the one hand, prices are dropping exponentially, which means this can be in the hands of, I mean, I be down there at the price of a smartphone. And yet, on the other hand, um, access can be a tough thing. You know, how many kids actually have access to this? Do they learn how to use it? Do they have access to the Internet to get it out? And and Kalani and, and Amber, I'd love some of your thoughts on this. There's a there's a. There's this dilemma that these things are coming down in price radically. And Amber, you had interesting thoughts that that you know you've really made a career of giving these tools to, to you know communities that don't have a lot of, of resources and they do a lot with them. Um, are, are we are we cruising towards like more universal access to things, or does this create a set of problems? How do you guys resolve this? Uh, I was just typing in the in the secret chat about. Um, how there are so many people that just buy, you know, they, they fund a Kickstarter or they hoard an object or they get the newest Oculus Rift and then it sits in their closet. And meanwhile, they're really guilty mm -hmm. about, oh, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to donate to this thing. It's like, if you just have somebody say, hey, got any weird junk in your closet? Just, we're going to come by and pick it up yeah. and we're going to take it away. And so we did that in Portland. We just said, anybody got an Oculus Rift lying around or a Vive or whatever? You know, we'll donate it either to Open Signal, which is the community TV station, or they would bring mm. it down to the boathouse where we were. This one guy who's worth many, many millions said, you know, I really wanted to be a DJ. Here's all my DJ gear. But my stipulation is you can't sell it. You just have to have it for the community. And so I would be the provisioner of that, that tech for the community. If that tech suddenly nice. gets lost and gets and some community member forget, it's like, great. If you wanted it that much, like, thank goodness, like, get it out of here. Um, but there's so much excess. It's kind of like you have all of these like lovely people stuck with so much time. And then you have a bunch of younger people that need that time. Like, can you match these up? Because there's always going to be that leading edge that buys all the stuff. Um, and you just have to convince them, you know, make, make them read Marie Kondo or, you know, your money or your life and be like, does this give me joy anymore? No, I haven't even opened the box. Well, guess what? It's going to give somebody else joy. You know, there's, just make it easy. Just remind yeah. me, Amber, um, in Pittsburgh, I you know I spend time there as well because of Maya and Carnegie Mellon, and and what's interesting there is that there's something called 412 Food Rescue, and every day um, you would get a text saying basically like there's food that's got to, about, about to be thrown out at this restaurant or thrown out at this um, at this bakery or this whatever, 
And it would be like, oh yeah, pick it up. And they would actually arrange for you to meet somebody at a food kitchen. And you'd actually get to see the people at the food kitchen, meet them and actually help give it out. And it was one of these things where you had little bursts of being able to feel good. And just about everybody in the region started using this thing. And, it, and it, they've served millions of food, food uh, portions this year and last year. And it's just this one wonderful thing. And it was a young woman who came up with the idea. She's like, how much stuff is getting wasted? And I would love to see kind of like the 412 food rescue, 412 is the area code for Pittsburgh, but um, you know, applied that idea, applied to what you just said. And it sounds like you're already doing it in, in Portland and other places. Um, Anuj, we're gonna have to say bye to you. I know you have to leave at 5.30 or you're gonna get in big trouble. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time. It's just fun seeing you again. It's been a while. Yeah, likewise. Uh, it's always great chatting with you and um, always the people that you interact with are blow my mind. Uh, really great to hear yeah, everybody's I thoughts. Wanna, and I want to thank you and I want to invite you to come by Gray Area virtually or hopefully in the real world because I think there's nothing more exciting than getting a community of people who are uh, you know, technologically competent, have a wide range of artistic perspectives and are pushing things to go to go bash on the technology and see what comes out of it. So that this has been a great setup for that. And I appreciate uh, the offer. It's very kind of you, Peter. I was very impressed by what I've heard and seen. And I looked at the website. Uh, I'm uh, pretty excited about it. And I, I'm looking for ways that um, even I could possibly help uh, with some of the things you guys are doing. So we'll be in touch. Know, is, thanks. And uh, thanks, 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 Great to meet everyone. everyone. And thank you for having me yep. today. Here's the goodbye button. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. You know, Barry, it's, it's interesting at this. This is a very interesting moment in time for tech because tech has kind of been under a fair amount of pressure recently, both because uh, of wealth, what it's done to, 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 to labor and kind of where social media is kind of having its current unpleasantness. And so here we are with an entirely new form of media, you know, and, and Amber, is, as McLuhan points out, each of these new medium come out and then you, you figure out what to do with them. And, you know, we all had a bunch of great theories about social media and we realized we're due for a course correction. What's interesting here is from a design point of view with the, this powerful stuff coming out, uh, perhaps we can end up thinking through how, uh, how we can get our communities to think through the most powerful ways to use this stuff that both brings people together. Kalani, that's your whole notion of what you're trying to do with virtual technology, the Gray Area Festival. How we can use the technologies to imagine better futures or to run scenarios of what doesn't work. That's the stuff that you were talking about, Mickey. Right, and Amber, a lot of the stuff you brought in out brought out uh, is just the diversity of communities that can play on this. So it, you know, it feels like there's a path if but we take it with this new stuff. Yeah, yeah unintended I mean, consequences. go ahead. Here you go. No, no, Amber, no, go no I've talked too much. Okay. <laughs> well, so have I. Um, maybe we all have, but no, um, <laughs> uh, if people are still listening. Um, no, I think, you know, there are these new mediums, as you were saying, new new technology ways of like embodying different things and telling stories, et cetera. Um, but uh, I guess the thing I wanted to say is that the context that those are all created in as a product of their times are kind of the a unifying factor in so far as like any any technology that's developed in a context that's not um, uh, that goes on offering myopic and narrow solutions and not on holistically understanding the context with which that technology is entering and, and interacting with the world in and doesn't try to uh, bring in as many stakeholders and perspectives into that conversation, including different disciplines and ways of thinking in the world, as well as different backgrounds and perspectives um, and experiences um, is going to fuck something up that was unintended. Um, and that's just as true of simulations with graphics cards and social media and um, any number of other things. And so I guess uh, we really need not to, it's not anything endemic to any specific technology, but our very ontology in which we are building our technologies that needs to be modified and expanded. Yes. 
And Amber, even just you, the, go ahead. yeah, you know, even just the level of privilege that's reflected in this conversation. I think when we're using words like democratization and access, that's problematic because we still know these people. Like we have connections to the tech billionaires and can ask them for their old equipment, and that's a level of privilege that a lot of people don't have. I want to just plug this very special book called Seeing, Naming, Knowing by Nora Khan, which has really influenced a lot of my thinking going into radical simulation. And the great power we yield with simulations is that it's the appearance of truth. So people assume it's true, right? And this is her idea and, and asking then, what are the parameters that define what's seen? And so even when we talk about bringing in different perspectives, maybe it's also about us getting out of the way and letting those perspectives really take the keys and really shape the entire worldview within that power, that technology of power. Because otherwise we have a singular perspective and I appreciate so much Amber's contribution in the chat, which is talking about this or Boris effect, if you want to just chime in and share that we come up with the same solutions over and over. Oh, yeah. again. Well, this is the problem. It's like when you have comfortable people making tech, people who have never experienced hunger or scarcity or bad Wi-Fi, you have people that only build surface level technologies. And without that depth, you don't get the graphic user interface. You don't get the mouse. You don't get James West microphone technology. And that was the special thing is like sometimes when you get a monopoly like the big bell company and you get a bell labs or you get a xerox park yes these things don't fundamentally make money or even general magic but the people that they include are important and in the in inclusion it's like oh my gosh it's not even just inclusion like i saw an ad for eight billion trees which is like a charity run by some guy that's like all we need to do is build trees it's like no you need to have indigenous people manage the forest because you don't understand that it's a 50 to 100 year at a time thing to think about with thousand years of history that's been handed down in story form, the best form of database, the best Oracle database technology. And when you don't have that, you're like, oh, let's just plant a tree. That's the difference between surface level and depth, understanding fundamentally and belonging to an ecosystem and saying we have you know, a history. And so my interest in is how do you translate those into a way that a like a, a person that you know wouldn't normally listen to those things like you can't use terminology that somebody might say oh that's woo woo or art doesn't mean anything you have to use new words <laughs> and then you know and then use whatever privilege you have right because i didn't grow up with a lot of money i have a lot of psych like psychological therapy that i have to do through that i still speak like this in this scary like kind of rapid fire uh scarcity method um, but if I can learn some of that and then be like, okay, what do I see coming from that perspective that I can help translate, then I can do a reasonable job. But just going back to the community and being like, here's how to be in a room full of people that you're afraid of. Here's your posture, <laughs> like it's gonna be okay. And then go into that room and sometimes translate for them. It's like people need escorts into this new world. The first time I was around millionaires and billionaires, I said, I have altitude sickness. I'm sick to my stomach I, 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 because I'm afraid. I don't know the quiet nonverbal mannerisms. You know, the first time being at Harvard Law School, it was, I don't understand the terminology you're using and I can't speak and I can't participate and I'm mute. And I felt like I was looked at like I was lazy, you know? And so I want to pick more apart and provide a language for that invisible because we have a caste structure in the United States. It's not class, it's, it's, there's not a lot of mobility. Totally. Um, so anyway, there's, there's too much there. But. <laughs> do, we, or do we need to learn to operate within it and train people to operate within it or can we dismantle it and build a better one, right? Uh, <laughs> it's a question. What we have to do, we can't do, you know? Yeah, there's, there's no one, one or other, right? Like it's a spectrum, right? Kalani, there's gonna yeah, be some I think that's a great, places, that's a great you know? question. I I don't know that we're going to solve that today, but I think, but I think it's a it's a grand grand question. You know, I think um, W. Arthur, um, uh, the guy who uh, um, I think I'm trying to remember his full name, Brian Arthur, W. Brian Arthur, um, from Santa Fe Institute, uh, did an amazing study of the nature of technology, and you can think of technology as everything from economics to um, to uh, organics, to whatever. You know, if you look at something from the top down, it looks mechanistic. If you look from the bottom up, it looks organic. And you looked at what actually happens. And one of the things that happens is something called structural deepening and fractal vascularization. And when we talk about like basically blowing up everything and starting from scratch, 
what we're really talking about is um, is losing all that fractal vascularization and structural deepening. And and the interesting question is, how do you make sure you don't blow up too much? How much? How do you not throw out the baby with the bathwater and lose some of the hard won rights and the hard won values that people have fought for over a long time? So it's a very complicated thing. I mean, it's about complex systems, which is kind of what we talk about every every week here. Um, how do we understand where the levers are for the system so that we can actually help do that um, and, and help change things? And I don't, you know, the people who helped get us here are not probably the people who are going to help get us to that next place. So we need to understand how to how to how to figure this out and also build on the great ideas that are out there. Uh, it's a, it just well, feels see, like a, a complicated world. These technologies show up right at a time. And I think this is where we began the show where we're undergoing and have to manage through very, very significant change. The tech world, when I first came out here, I think I've said this before, when I went to work for Steve Jobs, uh, he wanted to change the world, but the world didn't really care because we were just a little island over here. It didn't really matter in the economy. Now, of course, um, <clears throat> the grammar of social media, to, to use a McLuhan term, or it turns out the unintended way that all these algorithms show up when you stick a business model behind them, pulls for polarization, precisely at a time when there's less social capital in America. And so there's this huge responsibility to think through also, how are these things used to, to, to bring people uh, back together or to accomplish you know, what, what comes next? And that's in a very literal sense, Mick, like, okay, how do you simulate uh, an environment or a hurricane or a building that might or might not happen? There's a really excellent book that just came out. It was reviewed in the New Republic yesterday by Robert Putnam, who's the guy who wrote Bowling Alone. Uh, and it, it's it's called From I to We. And it takes a look at kind of American history over the last hundred years. And it draws a very interesting parallel between now and kind of an obvious time of parallel, the Gilded Age or the Industrial Revolution, the last time you had extreme wealth because basically you had, uh, you had Carnegie with steel and you had oil. And of course, that led into the progressive era. There was, uh, there was, there were child labor problems. There were, uh, uh, health and safety problems. And in a kind of a remarkable moment under Teddy Roosevelt, uh, we came through and we came together and we built a, a much more connected society. This is where high schools got created and Boy Scouts got created and many of the things that uh, Tocqueville likes, all these connection points. Um, that really originated kind mm -hmm. of the connected 20th century, even more than the than the New Deal does. And what, and what, what he points out in all of this is that stuff started fraying. They even did a word analysis from articles, and the word we was used much more early in the century, the word I much, much more later. And they even trace this back to even the, the 1960s and the hippie movement, do your own thing, was an individualist thing. And his whole point is, we are at a point of inflection now. Can we bring that, can we bring collective community stuff back, right? And, you know, is the, is the Me Too movement part of that? And, um, you know, if you looked at the movie that came out on Netflix this week about Facebook, it, 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 it has a stare in the face, the, the, the question of how do we bring community back? And I think it puts a responsibility on all of us with privilege messing with tech because the stuff that we're throwing out there has, has, a, has a big role. And that's, um, you know, I think that's the deeper meaning of why we're having the Gray Era Festival. Oh, I mean, although I, I mean, I do have to say it, the social dilemma that came out has been portrayed as also... Uh, a tech bros um, yeah. sort of yeah. uh, uh, redemption, you know, uh, prodigal son tour, yeah, because yeah, they yeah. basically never point out that, oh, by the way, first we made a lot of money and now we feel like we're going to talk about it. So, I mean, I, I do think that the, that these are complicated issues. And yeah. um, what I love is that it's actually getting uh, amplified. I, I think um, Kalani mentioned a book I feel like I need to read. So now I've got to go look up uh, Nora Khan and and it feels like a part of it is we have to do that. And also just what we're trying to do here is, which is bring on people that may, you know, that, that we're, we're trying to cross different networks together uh, because, because frankly, there aren't a lot of people that can, I think Amber said this, that, that can necessarily be code switchers in some of those places. And, um, and, and how do we help amplify that? Uh, where we can. Hey, before we Peter, you up, keep yeah, on trying to show we, some video. We don't know what's yeah, happening. Yeah, you had one more clip. Do we, do we want to go ahead and show your Esri here, or are we beyond it? What do you want to do? Sure. Yeah, just turn off the sound on it and start at 5. I'm going to turn off the sound, and you're going to tell us what's going on here. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so here's this person from the city department of Honolulu, and he wanted to prove a point. He said, look, 
the suburbs are expensive. There's a billion miles of asphalt that you have to put in. I want to prove to the city using this technology um, called it's called the city engine. So you could you could um, simulate what would happen if you put in public transit nodes in Honolulu. You could you could um, also have it simulate um, and prove that there would be a lot more expended money or a crime. So here's the proposed you know network here. Um, and then you could also show what would happen if you didn't put in the network and calculate all of the miles of the roads and the and the excess suburbanization that would happen because of that. And so he was able to use Zesri software to actually prove that uh, the city of Honolulu would save some number of millions of dollars by putting in transit um, and then also would have more walkability and it would be way less to maintain all of these roads. And I think if you go a little bit towards the end of the video, they, they actually show it to you. But when I saw this, I said, this is fantastic because it's not about saying public transit's good for people. It's about being able to prove with a simulation in a city that the um, that actually putting this in is good for everybody. It's good for the bottom line, but you're going to have less crime because you have way, way less people living in these like horrible copy paste architecture condo towns. Um, and they're actually able to do some. So, so here, here's his little slippy map. Um, well, we go. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So he's able to show here's all this extra suburbs that you have to build if you don't build that highway system. And it's just too expensive to maintain. Um, but if you build that, um, that whole hub, you don't have to have all of the stretchy suburbs. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to see, but he's going to, you know, he's going to like pull this, it back. This and then raises there's... the fundamental philosophical question. If you give a bunch of climate de deniers, a wonderful model of the climate and you let them crash the earth, will they come back reformed or will they just say your model had bad assumptions and walk away? <laughs> yeah. I don't think that there are, uh, it's, it's funny because when you talk, when I've talked with people where I'm like, Oh, you work in oil. They're like, yeah, of course we, we believe in climate change. It's just on our bottom line. We have 20 years to write off the, the $2 billion equipment that we just bought. And if we all rushed into climate change, it would be really expensive. So we, we don't want the EPA coming in because we'll have to pay all this money and taxes and all of these issues. So, you know, if we push off that legislation as long as possible, it's not yet profitable to be environmentally friendly. For them, it's a business equation. It's just like, look, I've got somebody breathing down my neck on the board and I have to make sure that this company grows. And the problem with a publicly traded company is it has to do that. So for them, it's not, I'm just gonna deny climate because I'm an idiot. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with bottom line tax write-offs working with a company and like making sure they can, you know, keep growing. Right. So, and then there's the people who are like, I deny the climate because, because people told me to. Right. And Peter Graham came up with this great article that was like, here are the people that are kind of radical thinkers. And here are the people that think they're radical, but they're actually followers. And then here are the people that are, you know, just like the radical follower type. It, it was this great quadrant system. Um, so yeah, when I've just kind of talked with people behind the scenes of it, it's, it's a whole different experience than people blatantly being like, I hate, I hate the environment. Well, all these people own ranches and they love protecting the, the, the land that they own and they love, you know, sustainably hunting animals on that land. You know, it's, it's just this, this schism, right? How it's painted, um, uh, in the world. Um, it's now 5.43 Pacific Horn time. <laughs> Uh, and what for those of us who are in San Francisco, uh, like I guess three of us who are here, um, while we were on today, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, um, which, which is quite a change oh, wow. heading into this election mm -hmm. moment. And there's going to be a candlelight vigil tonight at Harvey Milk Plaza with masks at 7 p.m. Uh, so for people who want to go to a vigil for Justice Ginsburg, uh, th 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 talk about something that changes a whole lot of the equation. There you go. A lot of change going on. Um, That's really sad. But we won't get into yeah. all of that here. Um, all right. Uh, thank you. Don't know how graphics Mitch cards fix that one. one. Yeah. Uh, 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 it's going to fix it. I think I think it shows us that uh, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And if we if we go back to the work they had to get done on the progressive era, this is a long project. It's a long-term project here, and um, 
Uh, and you're right, there's no immediate connection between GPUs and the present moment. But then again, we, we have to make it. It is up to us yeah. to make meaning with the tools that we have and the people around us. Uh, Amber, thank you so much. Uh, I haven't seen you in about a year since I was up in Portland and you gave me a wonderful tour of the emerging art media scene there and, and we got into stuff and this was just before the Gray Area Festival last year when I was researching the piece I was doing there. So thanks for being available on a moment's notice here. And, and Nick, uh, thank you for bringing in our friends from NVIDIA. This was a great, uh, a great thing. And Barry, uh, um, I'll always a pleasure. Later. Delightful to meet you, Amber. Thanks. Great to meet you. Thanks for everything. Nick, this time, why don't you take us out while I go hunt and figure out where the theme is? See, I have to get off and go it's find It's 545 oh, Pacific <laughs> Blade Runner quarantine today. See everybody for the weekend. I think we're just going to keep seeing that Esri clip for the next two, two days. Oh, here it comes.